Well, good evening, beloved, and happy Wednesday evening. And uh, we're doing our Wednesday night Bible study from the book of Hebrews this evening, Hebrews chapter 6. And so uh, let's begin our study together with prayer. And our Father in heaven, God, there is no one like you. There is no one who is holy like you, no one who is good and loving and faithful and eternal and mighty. And so we are grateful, God, for who you are and how you have revealed yourself to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, we give you praise and gratitude. Thank you, God, for what you did for us on the cross. All glory and power, majesty and praise be unto you before time, now, and forever. And Holy Spirit, God, you are our teacher, and we love you. Reveal spiritual truth to us tonight from your word, and give us faith to receive it and apply it to our lives with encouragement and the assurance to draw near and hold fast our confession and remain faithful and to endure until the end for your glory and our joy and strength is our prayer in the name which is above every name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and hallelujah. Well, Hebrews chapter 6 is where we left off last week. Verse 3, actually verse 4 is where we're going to pick up. And some call this a very controversial passage of Scripture. And I hope that by the time we get through this evening, you'll see that it's actually a very assuring passage. Uh, passage of scripture for us, but it's frightful as it describes those who reject Jesus Christ. Well, we begin in verse 4, Hebrews chapter 6, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Amen. Okay, well, key words, a couple of key words in this phrase, in this, uh, when he talks in, in verse 4 uh, through uh, uh, 8, about those who, uh, how it's impossible for those who have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. He doesn't use the word you or we or us. And he'll use that throughout the, the uh, book. He's, he says they and them. And so he's not talking to those Hebrew believers who are being tempted to forsake their faith but with strong, strong warning and encouragement as to what happens when someone does uh, reject Christ. Uh, there's a, a strong warning. And then the, the key phrase, the key word here, yet in your case, verse 9, yet in your case, beloved, <laughs> there's, their, there's that name I like to call you, and uh, because it's biblical, loved by God, and by me, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. And talks about their ministry, and that as you still do. 
and that uh, in verse 11, we have the full assurance of hope until the end. And with the encouragement of those who've gone before us, and he'll get to those in chapter 11 especially. But uh, all right, we've got, to, we've got to work through these difficult verses about these uh, individuals that have these five characteristics. Look at them again in verse 4 and 5. He says, It is impossible in the case of those who, and then there's a five-fold description. Look at it with me in verse 4. First of all, those who have once been enlightened. Now who, now who would those be? Once who had, those who had once been enlightened. Uh, all five of these, you, there's a reference here to that male population that came out of Egypt that we've talked about so much in chapter 3 and 4 that uh, were once enlightened. In other words, they were at the foot of Mount Sinai when the Ten Commandments were given. They heard the Word of God. They were enlightened by that first word. Put door over the uh, your uh, put blood over the doorpost of the of the uh, lamb that you sacrifice. That's enlightenment. Here's what's going to happen. But it's also a reference, I believe, to those that Jesus referred to in the parable of the four soils that hear the word of God, but it falls on hard soil. These are the ones who hear the word of God. Uh, those that the seed of the word of God fell on shallow soil, rocky soil. They heard the word, it says. They were enlightened, started to grow, but had no, no root and so quickly uh, died. And then those who heard the word in the, among the thorns and the thistles, they were crowded. It was a crowded soil, grew, but did not bear fruit. As, as in contrast to those who heard the word of God and the word fell on good soil, grew and bare a fruit and bore fruit 30, 60, and even a hundredfold. And so who had once been enlightened, second characteristic, verse four, look at it, who have tasted the heavenly gift. Now, key, phrase, key word there is tasted, they had a taste, but they didn't swallow much. They didn't drink deep. They just had a taste of the heavenly gift. Now again, back to that group that came out of Egypt, they ate the manna. They tasted the heavenly gift, and yet they still rebelled and refused to, to believe. They had an unbelieving heart, and so they did not go into the promised rest, the promised land, but died in the wilderness. And it was impossible to restore them. Uh, we'll talk some more here in just a moment. But again, to people in this age, in the Christian age, who have tasted the heavenly gift, I would say that describes a group that hung around church for a long time. And they were around a lot of love and joy and peace, a lot of Christian fellowship, even though their heart was unregenerate. They never were born from above. They were just good religious people. They did good things, but, uh, but never accepted the reality of the confession of sin and the need for a Savior, and with a repentant heart believed in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But they were around. The, they tasted the heavenly gift, but did not swallow. Those who have shared in the Holy Spirit. Again, I, I, back to the group that came out of Egypt, there in the wilderness, uh, before they went into the promised land, there was the cloud by day and the fire by night. They were benefit. They benefited from the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they had shared in that experience. And in the Christian age, I would talk about that same group that uh, shared in the fellowship of believers that love, but never were on the giving end of it because they didn't have it. 
They never received the Spirit of God, the life of Jesus as their life. Verse 5, two more. They have tasted the goodness of the Word of God. Again, key word there is tasted. They didn't drink deep, but they did taste. Back to that uh, parable that Jesus told about the soils. They heard, or the one that we'll look at Sunday from Matthew 7, about uh, those who hear my words and do them, is like the man who built his house on the solid rock. Unlike those who hear and do not do, what I say, those that built their house on the sand. And so just hearing, uh, we've got to go beyond that. But obedience. And so verse 5, tasted the word of God and the powers of the age to come. In other words, miraculous things. Uh, I think of the, what we talked about last Sunday when Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but those who do the will of my Father who, which is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not uh, 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 cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty miracles in your name? I will say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. There's a difference, beloved, with a casual acquaintance with the Lord and a personal, intimate, interactive, which is that word no, with the Lord, that has his life living as your life. And of course, that is the will of God, that you believe in the one whom he has sent, believe in Jesus Christ. That is doing the will of God, believing in him. And as we've said and certainly have seen over the last several months, when you believe there's actions that are inseparable with that faith, even though they may not be popular, even though people may make fun of you. When you believe something, you do after you believe. And when you don't believe, you do not have that work. You do something different. You may go through the motions of that, but your heart is far from it. Story number five, little boy running around, remember? Okay. So the five things that characterized this group that he's talking about, now he's not saying you, he's saying they, that's very important. He says, and then have fallen away, and then they have fallen away, it's impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Wow. Now, this is the, this is the verse that uh, becomes controversial, especially with the uh, uh, Reformation doctrine that uh, was developed and handed down of the security of the believer. Now, if you remember from our Wednesday night historical study, both John Calvin and Joseph Arminius uh, uh, held to the, 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 uh, uh, persever the, the perseverance of the saints. Calvin much more so than Joseph Arminius, but... Uh, uh, but still, uh, now the followers of Arminius, they wandered away from it. But the perseverance of the saints, that the saints will persevere to the end. And those are the ones who endure. Well, it's of course, Baptist phrase for that, which is not biblical, once saved, always saved. But we do teach that once you have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, Nothing can change that relationship. Now, fellowship with God can change, and sometimes it does. And we've known people who profess their faith in Christ, at, that they had a new relationship with God, and then later wandered away, and as far as we know, never came back. But we're not to judge. Remember, we don't judge people. There's only one judge, and it's not you and not me. We can't see the heart. And we certainly do know the uh, human experience, some, unfortunately, 
of having the experience of having a child that uh, forsook the family and disowned the family and lived accordingly. Even though they were brought up in the faith, they were brought up in the tradition of the church and Sunday school or training union and on and on. But later as young adults adopted a different, an ungodly lifestyle and, uh, and, and continued that. Well, even though they did, that didn't change their relationship with their parents. They're, they were still the son and daughter of their parents, although you wouldn't know it by their behavior. Well, there's believers that are like that as well. And so we, we, uh, the only way we can deal with that is we would say, well, uh, maybe they never were born from above. Maybe they were like that seed that fell on hard soil, shallow soil, crowded soil that Jesus talked about. Never bore fruit that, uh, again, Jesus talked about that you will know them by their fruits. Okay, so we still have to wrestle with this. What does it mean? And as you would probably know, there are different interpretations of this group that the writer of Hebrews is talking about who had this fivefold experience that would identify them with believers and yet they fell away. And he says it's impossible for, to restore them. So first of all, uh, some would say these are true believers who turn against Christ and deny him. All right, that's one interpretation of this. Another interpretation, this is true believers who fall into serious sin, like Peter or like King David. Remember, Peter denied Christ, and King David uh, not only had that adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, but then had her husband murdered. And uh, so some would say it's, it has to do with falling into terrible sin, impossible to restore. Uh, another interpretation, professing Christians who are not true believers, like the ones Jesus described in the parables of the soil in Matthew 13 that we've been talking about. Fourth uh, interpretation, professing Christians who are not true believers, but who have had a very in-depth exposure to the truth. That group I'm talking about that hangs around in church and enjoys the fellowship because these are good people, loving people. Yeah, they have some problems, but so does everyone else. And, and it's a lot better than the other organizations in the world. I think I'll just go to church. That group never become true believers. And then another, a fifth uh, interpretation, this is a hypothetical group that doesn't really exist, but that the author uses to strengthen his argument that Hebrews need to persevere in their faith. So it could be, uh, could be kind of like that uh, story I told one Sunday and and uh, on the way home from church, Dan, the little guy at that time, he said, Daddy, that was a good story you told today. Was that true or were you just preaching? <laughs> you know, I got a lot of stories and uh, some of them are true because they're experiences I've had or some that I've heard of, but some are also parables. that <laughs> I just said, you know, there was a guy one time that, uh, well, that's just a good story that has a spiritual truth, a parable. So the writer of Hebrews may be talking about this hypothetical group and refers to them as they. And, but here's the, uh, here's the uh, uh, point. He's already made reference to a real group that this happened to, as we've referred to, the male population that came out of Egypt, that 602,000 men that uh, refused to believe, refused to go into the promised land because of fear, and uh, that God really hadn't promised he wasn't faithful. And so they died in the wilderness, even though they wanted to. They were not restored by repentance. Like Esau, that the writer of Hebrews will refer to in a, later on in another chapter, even though they repented with tears, they did not get the blessing. So you really have to decide, so which one of those five would you be? 
Uh, let's see if we can remember them. First, true believers who deny their faith, and so they fall away. And John Wesley taught that, by the way. And those of you, maybe you brought up with that in, uh, in an assembly of God. Many, some of the assembly of God are Pentecostal. Uh, what we call charismatic uh, churches uh, will teach that, that you can lose your salvation. That would be uh, one interpretation. Or another interpretation would be that this is a group that uh, has committed some serious sin uh, that is unconfessed and not repented of. And so it's uh, impossible for them. They lose their salvation, I guess. Or the group that uh, is uh, professing believers, but not true believers, as we've referred to, are those that have had a very, we would say, an in-depth exposure with that five-fold description, and yet never coming to personal faith in Jesus Christ. A lot of head knowledge, but never uh, heart knowledge, or a uh, hypothetical group. Now, beloved, you can find a lot of wonderful, good people that uh, maybe even family and friends that adopt one of those. You're going to have to decide which one uh, you land on. And probably, as you can tell from what I've said so far, uh, I kind of go into the stream of the two of those, those that... Uh, uh, hang around professing believers, very good church members, but never having been born from above. Name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but certainly on a church roll. Or, and or, so similar, those that have maybe even been Sunday school teachers and preachers and deacons, like the group that Jesus referred to in Matthew 7. We prophesied in your name with Lord, Lord, we call you. In other words, they had the words and even the actions, but their heart was far from Jesus, never have been born again. Had an in-depth exposure to the truth, but never coming to a place of personal repentance and faith. And that's how I understand but, and the illustration, let's look at the illustration again, verse 7, because I think this is very instructive to the heart. What kind of seed uh, falls on that heart? For, the, for land that has drunk the rain, not tasted, but drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those who for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. I would say that's good soil where seed falls and then watered by the word of God, watered by the spirit of God and grows and bears fruit. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is, excuse me, is to be burned. Okay. So what kind of seed was received? What kind of soil was that? And, and if it brings forth thorns and thistles, it's like that group that Jesus talked about, that we talked about last Sunday, a diseased heart, not a new heart. But all that it brings forth with the rain, but just tasting. Now these are people that God blesses. He blesses with miracles. He blesses with uh, uh, good things like rain. Jesus said, he makes it the Father, your Father in heaven makes it rain on ju the just and the unjust, telling us how to bless people, how to bless our enemies. Luke uh, 6, he says it even stronger. Your Father in heaven is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. He is kind to the wicked and the ungrateful, because that's who God is. But having given the gift of his son, this group has rejected. That's what this means when he's talking about those that, uh, in chapter 6, that what they do, they crucify once again the Son of God and hold him up to contempt. 
This is what the Jewish leaders did, uh, holding him up to content. It's impossible to restore them because in order to do that, they would once again, uh, Jesus would once again need to be crucified. That's not going to happen. And hold and held up to open contempt. That's not going to happen. That was a once for all event that the Father uh, ordained so Jesus would take all of our sins and the sins of the whole world not to be repeated again because he cannot die again. He cannot be put to open contempt again. He is exalted and seated at the right hand of power with all authority given unto him. It's impossible for him to go through that again. Here's uh, the seriousness of what he is talking about. The seriousness of hearing the gospel and rejecting Jesus Christ. And beloved, that's who I believe will be punished forever because it will be impossible to restore them to repentance again. The call of God to repent of sin. This is the group that I believe Jesus was talking about that commit the unforgivable sin, which is this, rejecting forgiveness of sins, which is rejecting Jesus Christ, rejecting the Holy Spirit bringing the gospel to a person's heart. Now, I've seen many people that have rejected and rejected and rejected and then been saved. We don't know when God sees that heart and knows the full and final rejection. Let me tell you an awful story. Uh, there, that first uh, church in Rotan, boy, I got an education there in a short period of time. Uh, the Lord gave me so many experiences. But right away, I was told, you need to go witness to this uh, man and, uh, and his sons. There's three of his sons still living. And uh, he was once uh, in our church, but then had a terrible experience and uh, has rejected Christ. Well, I went to see him. Well, he's an alcoholic. He was drunk when I uh, talked to him. And he said, you're wasting your time. I don't believe in God. I uh, don't believe in, in Jesus. I've rejected him. And, uh, and so I just asked him, I said, well, why? What happened? And he kind of looked at me for a minute and he said, uh, uh, I lost a son and, and I was to blame. I was drunk. And uh, didn't and he didn't he went into more detail. I won't share now, but he he first blamed himself, but then couldn't handle that, and so he blamed God. And like so many, Chuck Templeton is that example we've used. Billy Graham's associate, forming Campus Crusade for Christ, and uh, rejected Christ because he could not justify how a good God, all-powerful, would allow suffering in the world. Well, I went back to see that man and time and time again. Actually, we became friends of, of a sort, but he would not, when, we, when I would bring up, please, won't you accept Christ? He would not, and that's when our conversations would end. Well, he died a most miserable death I've ever seen. He was in the hospital. His sons were there. I went to visit him several times over about a week period. And he got worse and worse and worse. The last day of his life, he was restrained, sitting straight up in bed, shaking his head and yelling out, no, 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 with the most horrific look on his face I'd ever seen in anybody. It was frightening. His three sons were there, and he died in that condition. I believe he was seeing where he was headed. At his funeral, it was only the three sons 
and the two funeral home directors who were brothers and myself. And I said this, not to condemn him, not to judge him. I simply said this by, by the way he died that we all saw. I said, you three boys, they were older than I. I was. I say, you, th you three sons, if your father could come back from where he is right now, what do you think he would tell you? And I left it at that. And then I preached the gospel to them. Not saying where he was, but if he could come back from where he is, what do you think he would tell you? Because they saw the way he died. Okay, well, we've got to finish this up. We're about to run out of time. I don't even give that story a number. It's too frightening. But... Uh, We've got to finish this up because verse 9, look at it with me again, ends with great encouragement. He says, though we speak this way, now here we go with we, not they, though we speak this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. Boy, he's gotten into his encouraging mode, calling them beloved. We're sure of better things for you, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust to overlook your work. He's referring to the good things that they had done before they had started with the persecution and even during the persecution, uh, how they uh, were imprisoned because they were helping their, uh, uh, the family of God. He says, God remembers that, how you're serving in the saints as you still do. He says, There's, you haven't forsaken the faith. Don't do it. Uh, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not become sluggish. He's encouraging them not to be dull hearers. Remember when he referred to that? He's, he's encouraging them not to give up the serving, not to give up uh, 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 their, their work of love uh, to their ministry to the saints and to endure uh, with that full assurance of hope. Hope is what gives us that endurance to deal with suffering, to deal with the things that we have not asked for that are happening to us, to deal with the things that we can't understand, but we still have full assurance of hope. Oh, he'll talk about it in Hebrews 11. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And beloved, we're living in a day now, 2020, good grief, are you kidding me? All the things of that, that I believe it's a time that God has given to us to strengthen our faith and hope because we don't understand. There's so much uncertainty. We don't understand how this virus works and how it attacks some and others not and some deeply unto death and others mildly and, and then some that have symptoms that won't go away and some that recover and yet keep testing positive for it. Good night. What is that about? And what are they to do? And so many question marks with the election. We don't know the outcome yet. It's still under investigation. And even when, we, when it does, good grief, what's going to happen? Doesn't look good either one getting it. We, we, good night. And there's so many question marks in the midst of this. This is the time for our faith to grow. And that's why, beloved, I pray for you every day and take a different group by name every week and pray that your faith would grow and be fruitful in hope with love, abounding with wisdom. This is the time for the spiritual realities of our life to really shine forth in a day that is growing, that is uncertain, and it seems to be even more uncertain as we go. And beloved, this is why singing is so important now. Uh, today, as you know, I posted that song, How Firm a Foundation. 
You know, I was raised in Trinity Baptist Church in San Antonio. We moved to Austin, Hyde Park Baptist Church in Austin. And then when we moved to Houston when I was in junior high, we were Second Baptist Church in Houston. I'm telling you, those days in the 60s and the 70s, early 70s, we sang these great old hymns. And that's why it... It, I, I like listening to them and singing them myself and sharing them with you. I love the contemporary songs too. I, that strengthens my faith as well. But boy, those ones that the foundation uh, that I was raised with really, really ring my bell, as they say. And, and, it, and it encourages me. It encourages my faith. It's where my faith began and grew and was strengthened. And, and so that's why I share them with you. And this is a day for singing. So 